everyone. In this video, we're going to continue our exploration of definite integrals. Remember, a definite integral has an integral sign with x equals a and x equals b at the bottom and the top. And what it means is net area, where we count area above the x-axis as positive and below the x-axis as negative. Remember, in the last video, we did some estimations of definite integrals using Riemann sums. In this video, we're going to find exact areas. We're going to graph some functions that have a happy coincidence where the area above or below the x-axis just so happens to be exactly a triangle or a rectangle or a basic shape that you can do using basic geometry. It's important to pay attention to the wording of the problem. If a problem says use basic geometry, it's telling you as a hint that when you graph this function, you get a basic shape. Today's lesson is going to be about definite integrals that boil down to basic shapes. So I want to remind you of a basic shape that you should know coming into this class. The equation of a circle of radius r centered at the origin. Now if we pick a point on the circle x comma y, there's a right triangle that corresponds to that point. One side of the triangle is the x value and the other side of the triangle is the y value. Using Pythagorean theorem on this triangle, we obtain the equation of the circle. Now most functions are expressed with y on the left and a function of x on the right. So let's solve this equation for y, subtracting x squared from both sides and then taking the square root on both sides. The plus sign corresponds to the top half of the circle and the minus sign to the bottom half of the circle. So suppose I wanted to graph the function y is equal to the positive square root of 25 minus x squared. This has the format of the equation of a circle centered at the origin with radius 5 because 25 is 5 squared so the radius is 5. The graph of this function is the top half of a circle of radius 5. Let's try another one. The equation of a circle has to be written in the format r squared minus x squared. So we're going to write this 3 as square root of 3 then squared. So it looks like our radius is square root of 3. So the graph of this function is the bottom half of a circle of radius square root of 3. Don't worry if your picture is not that great. You can tell I'm not that great of an artist as well. Let's do an example of a definite integral. We're looking for the net area in between the graph of this function and the x-axis from x equals negative 3 to x equals 0. The equation y equals negative square root of 9 minus x squared is the bottom half half of a circle of radius 3. We're looking for net area between this function and the x-axis from x equals negative 3 to x equals 0. We're restricting our attention to this region here. This is a quarter of a circle and I hope you remember the area of a circle. It's pi r squared. So we're looking for a quarter of pi r squared with a radius of 3. Don't forget that when the area is underneath the x-axis we need to include a negative sign. Our final answer is negative 9 pi over 4. Let's do another example. For number 2, we're going to graph y equals x minus 1. Remember that y equals x minus 1 has slope 1 and y intercept negative 1. These basics about graphing lines I assume that you know coming into this class. Let's look carefully at what the question is asking. The net area in between this line and the x-axis from x equals 0 to x equals 3. The intercept of this line occurs at x equals 1. That's something I assume you can figure out on your own. So x equals 3 is somewhere around here. Now the area in question, as you can see, there's a little bit under the axis and a bit above the axis. Now let's do the area of a triangle, which is 1 half base times height. What is the length of the base of that triangle? You got it, it's 1. What is the height of that triangle? Here I'm assuming that you can figure out what is the intercept on this line. You got it, that's at y equals negative 1, so the height of this triangle is 1. And don't forget, it's counted as negative because it's under the x-axis. Now let's add to that of the positive area of this triangle. The second triangle has base 2 from 1 to 3, and now we have to figure out what is the height of this triangle. What is the height of this function at x equals 3? This point right here on the line is 3 comma what? What do you get when you plug x equals 3 into the line function? 3 minus 1 is 2. The height is 2. So the height of the second triangle is 2. Finally, we need to add this all up and get our final answer. 
the value of this definite integral is 3 halves. Now notice that I'm a bit cavalier about adding these fractions up. I assume that you have the sophistication in this class to figure out how to add the fractions yourself. If the video is going too fast for you, or if you need more details to be spelled out about how to add these fractions, that's up to you. Pause the video, take the initiative, do it on your own, and figure it out. We're going to do one more example here using a piecewise function. I hope you remember how to graph piecewise functions. As you can see, there's a square root of r squared minus x squared as one portion of the graph and y equals negative x as another portion of the graph. First, let's graph a circle of radius 1 center to the origin. Considering there's no negative sign in front of this square root, we assume that it's the positive or the top half of the circle. This is valid as long as the x values are between negative 1 and positive 1. Notice that negative 1 and positive 1 are included in the range for the top half of the circle part. The next thing we need to graph is y equals negative x. y equals negative x is a line with slope negative 1. Now we're not going to draw that entire line because we have to pay attention to the context of our problem. In our problem, the y equals negative x line is only valid if x is greater than 1. We only want this line past x equals 1. So from here on. So this over here is the y equals negative x graph, but the whole thing is not drawn. We cut it off. We only draw it past x equals 1. And the rest of the graph is completely irrelevant for this problem. We're looking for the area in between the blue function and the x-axis from x equals negative 1 to x equals 5, in between the function and the x-axis. Once we get to x equals 1, now there's a break in the function. And from x equals 1 to x equals 5, we have an entirely different shape. We're looking for this area, so we should be doing pi r squared divided by 2. How can we figure out this area using basic shapes? We're going to break it down into a rectangle stacked on top of a triangle. And what is the area of this rectangle? The width goes from 1 to 5, so the width is 4. The height of this rectangle is 1, so the distance from here to here is 1. And now finally we need to find the area of the triangle. Of course this triangle is underneath the x-axis, so it will be counted as negative. The base is 4. Remember that this graph right here is y equals negative x, so the y value is negative the x value. So now that we've got the corners labeled, so the height is 4. Here we can get to a final answer of pi over 2 minus 12. This is a net area. Does it make sense in our problem? So about 3 over 2 minus 12. Overall this is negative. That agrees with our picture. We have a bit of area that is counted as positive and a huge portion of area that's counted as negative. Overall for this whole picture is negative. Now that you have a good idea about what definite integrals are, let's talk about additional properties. The first property is that if I take a definite integral from a to a, this gives zero. Now don't memorize this. Understand it. Suppose that I had some random function that I drew and then I wanted to find the area from x equals a to x equals a. This would essentially be a tiny sliver that has no width at all, so it would have area 0. The second property is if I have an integral from b to a, that's the negative of the integral from a to b. Again, don't memorize this, understand it. So the integral on the left is counting the x-axis in the negative direction from b to a. The integral on the right is counting it in the positive direction from a to b. So these two integrals are off from each other by a minus sign. Definite integrals are what's called additive. The definite integral of the quantity f plus g is equal to the definite integral of f plus the definite integral of g. Let's visualize it. Suppose that this was a function f of x and g of x looks something like that. When I add together these two graphs, I'll get a new graph for f of x plus g of x. Essentially, I take the height of the function for g and add it together with the height of the function for f. So the sum graph should also look squiggly, but it should be getting bigger and bigger towards the right. Let's say the f plus g graph looks something like that. The area under the f function is here and the area under the g function is here. I hope that you understand that the drawings are a little rough, but the idea works. The next property is that if we have a definite integral and if c is a constant, we can pull constants out of the definite integrals. Let's visualize it. 
Suppose that I graphed a function f of x. Now multiply that function, for example, times c equals 3. That means each of the heights gets tripled. So I can first find the area and then triple that in order to find the total area. I hope properties number 3 and 4 look familiar to you. Numbers 3 and 4 are called linearity. Definite integrals are linear. The next property of integrals is breaking things up along the x-axis. This property says that if I have a definite integral from a to c with b in the middle, I can break that up into an integral from a to b. That would first give me the net area from a to b, and then as a separate problem, I can find the net area from b to c and add the results. The next property is if we take the definite integral of a constant with respect to x. In this case, we will be drawing simply y equals c. Then the definite integral from a to b, in this case, ends up being simply a rectangle, where the height of the rectangle is c, and the width of the rectangle is b minus a. Finally, one more property. Suppose that I had three functions, a small, medium, and large function, for x values in the interval a, b. Then the corresponding intervals follow the same inequality. Now suppose that I had an f function, which which was small and even negative, a g function which was a medium height, and an h function which was the biggest. Now in between x equals a and x equals b, the definite integral for the f function is most certainly the smallest as it is a negative number for this picture. Now the definite integral for the g function is some positive number, and surely the definite integral for the h function is an even bigger positive number for this picture. For small functions, you get small definite integrals, and bigger functions, you get bigger definite integrals. Let's do another example. In order to graph the function, it's rather long. I don't expect that you know what the graph of this whole entire function is. However, using properties of integrals that we covered on the last slide, in order to break this up into two separate integrals, I can also pull this negative sign out in front. Now I have two separate problems which are individually manageable. Now the absolute value function I hope you remember absolute value of x is a v-shape. Now we don't have absolute value of x. We have absolute value of x minus 4. What happens when you replace x with x minus 4? The function shifts 4 units to the right. And we're going to find the area in between the function and the x-axis from x equals 0 to x equals 5. The first triangle has base 4 and height 4. The second triangle has base 1 and height 1. We must be very careful here. That minus sign is in front of the whole integral. So we must put the value of the whole integral in parentheses with the minus sign distributing through the whole integral. The whole integral is a half 4 times 4 plus a half 1 times 1 for the value of this integral. And finally, we have the second integral, a quarter of a circle. Make sure you can follow the calculations on the rest of this slide. They're very similar to the example on the previous slide. So I hope you enjoyed this video on definite integrals. And these types of problems are giving you more and more opportunities to brush up on your basics. So seek out more problems in the book, start the homework super early before you get to class, and we'll see you soon.